This is part one of two of our symposium with Nicolia Christie. Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free exchange of ideas. We are so glad you could join us, friends. I'm Susan, your host today, and today we have Nicolia Christie. She's kind enough to join us for a new symposium as we continue consciously exploring. Welcome, Nicolia. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, we're delighted to have you, and uh, I think this is going to be quite an exciting symposium because uh, we're very much resonating with your work. But before we get into it much, could you tell us a little bit about yourselves for our listeners' sake, especially your awakening as well as your work both with personal and global evolution? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, of course. Thank you for asking, and um, and do do put the full stop on if I'm I'm going on for too long. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, my awakening. Well, um, I'll try and say it as succinctly as I can. My spiritual awakening was when I was 17, and um, I was introduced to um, a, a beautiful Bulgarian spiritual master, um, Omran Mikhail Ivanov. Um, and at the same time, when I was 17, I discovered Gandhi. And um, those two in particular were very, very powerful influences for me when I was 17. And at the sa- in the same year, I also discovered Jung. And, of course, I didn't really think anything about this at all, really, until recently when I suddenly realized around my new book that's coming out, Contemporary Spirituality for an Evolving World, um, I suddenly realized that book is about uh, psychological, conscious and spiritual evolution. And my spiritual awakening when I was 17, the the three awakeners, if you like, for me were psychological, young, uh, conscious and spiritual evolution being Gandhi and um, Omram, Omram Mikhail Ivanhoff. So it, I feel like at some level with this contemporary spirituality for an evolving world book that I've come full circle and I've kind of, you know, anchored right into uh, what got initiated when I was 17 years of age so that was my spiritual awakening and I would say that I spent from 17 until 30 working very deeply in my own spiritual awakening and uh, so those years were very much about spiritual awakening what I discovered when I look back is uh, well when I got to 30 I suddenly became very interested in myself as a psychological being Mm-hmm. Um, and my own deep healing that that was needed, and so I went into um, psychotherapy. I started to see a therapist, and uh, psychosynthesis psychotherapy, which is a Sagioli's uh, psychotherapy. Um, I was looking for a transpersonal, humanistic psychotherapy. I didn't want a textbook therapy with textbook answers. I wanted a psychotherapy that treats the person and views the person as a soul. And then that's how I discovered psychosynthesis and um, core process psychotherapy as well. Um, so I, I began my psychological uh, transformation, if you like, healing and transformation journey then. And so the whole of my 20s were about my spiritual awakening. The whole of my 30s were about my psychological awakening. What I came to realize is that without the psychological awakening, uh, we, in effect, we we have this this sort of thing I term as balloon syndrome, uh, where often with spirituality, um, people can be very in quote spiritual, um, but they're like balloons floating up into the ethers if you don't have the psychological grounding. And to me, it's the the psychological that really grounds our spirituality, enables, and enables us to incarnate more of the higher self. 
um, there's something about spiritual awakening without the psychological uh, evolution that in a way only allows us to have a how can I say it's like a not a superficial expression of uh, spirituality but it's it lacks the depth it lacks the grounding it lacks the capacity to really anchor us fully here on the earth because many people who are in quote spiritually awake um, most of the time are actually not really here you know they're kind of split off at some level because the, the psychological, the historical story that we each carry uh, from incarnation to, you know, to the, the present day, um, that psychological story is often too painful. So it, it, it gets pushed into the unconscious and then that creates a split in the self. So for me, a well-rounded human being is someone who is spiritually awake, but is also psychologically aware psychologically psychologically conscious and um and then the conscious evolution which is really for me the era that we're moving into is our conscious evolution as you know incarnating and incarnated uh, beings into to sort of a physical form on earth um the conscious evolution is the piece that is like the bridge between the two now that's how i see that we're consciously evolving beings so my my 20s were spent you know, being very spiritual and kind of the balloon syndrome myself up there in ether, spiritualizing everything, uh, which was wonderful. And at the same time, it wasn't as grounded as it needs to be. And then I went into the psychological uh, decade, turned myself inside out, left no stone unturned and shone the, the, the light of uh, consciousness into every nook and cranny within myself to uh, clear it really to clear to heal to dissolve and then arrived if you like at 39 years of age uh, with that balance of the psychological and spiritual and at that point that's when I I had my major major collapse and um, had my death experience on Easter Sunday 2002 because uh, yeah, when I was 39 was in 2002 so yes it was uh, yet another turn of the wheel when I was 39 uh, the beginning of a seven-year process uh, that took me to 2009 to recover from it. I call it my shamanic death, and it was in every respect of that terminology, it was a shamanic death. And who I was when I went into it and who I emerged as was more, I can't say as a different person, a different being, but it was more of the being that I am. It was a seven-year incarnational process of, uh, you know, uh, a vast aspect of my higher self because in a way the container had been prepared in the 20 in my 20s and in my 30s I unconsciously I didn't realize this at the time had been preparing the container because again I'm someone who leaves no stone unturned you know I want to go to the very depth to the very core of whatever it is I'm needing to understand to to look at and to that that's what I do I go to the core so the what I was doing unconsciously was preparing my, if you like, physical container, my physical form for the energies of more of my higher self to incarnate. Because, you know, the vast majority of the higher self is outside of the body. You know, if we were to incarnate that into the body, the body wouldn't be able to handle the frequency of it. So I, you know, I feel the work that I was doing in my 20s and my 30s was very much about preparing for a very, very high frequency to come in. And also, just to add this other piece, is that um, in 1997, in amongst all of this time, um, I started to have uh, what was the beginning of five years of um, extra-dimensional, out-of-body experiences that were very, very, very intense. And part of the reason I believe um, I had the major, the complete collapse, I'm mean, a totally physically collapsed uh, on March the 16th, 2002, was because the energy that had been coming into my body was so intense, so prolific, uh, such a high frequency that my nervous system, uh, I believe, uh, it blew it, it fried my nervous system. Sure did right <laughs> out. <laughs> It did, you know, because the experiences when they happened were unlike anything I'd heard of. I hadn't actually heard of anyone having these specific experiences of what was happening in my body, where I was actually going aware of my body, but out of my body at the same time. 
very, very profound. So, you know, all of this took place from sort of 17 until 39. And then at 39, bang, I went down and I died on Easter Sunday, 2002. I actually physically died. I had a conscious death experience where I died. I saw myself dying. I came out of my body. I saw my body and I came back into my body. And from Easter Sunday, 2002 until 2009, I literally crawled my way back to um, some semblance of health. For, for many years, I never, ever thought I would be a functioning member of the human race physically again. Um, so it's quite a miracle for me that I sit here today a healthy a human. A rebirth, almost. Yeah, total, total. And I, yeah, I describe it in Clarion Call as two lives in one, in the respect that I had reached the, uh, I guess, what I'd come here to do for my own evolution. I had reached that by the time I was 39. So what I feel had happened is that the death had to happen. And so I saw myself, I experienced myself dying, I saw myself age, I felt myself aging to around the age of about 86, 87. Um, I left my body, I saw my body on the bed, uh, very, very uh, elderly, um, very, very thin, very frail. And then I came back in and uh, began, as I say, seven year grueling, grueling journey back to life again. And, you know, the body, my, this physical body, uh, adjusting to the higher frequency of the incarnating higher self that had literally poured into my system once um, the death experience had happened on Easter Sunday, 2002. That's quite an amazing journey you've been on. And I'm so appreciative of what you've described as a integrated and whole journey and so often people want to just jump into the spiritual without doing the work and I loved how you described yourself as having to dig in and ev explore every nook and cranny and I do feel that that's so important because if we don't it comes back at a time when perhaps we're on the cusp of a, of a spiritual upgrade so to speak and that might stop us. So it sounds like you really, really have done your work. And it's interesting that you said, spoke of seven years. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a, a very s important time frame. Um, yeah. And that shamanic death is uh, quite something. So very appreciative of what you've shared of yourself. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. Hi, this is Sibel, and that, that's a incredible background to understand your other work from. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your book, 2012, The Clarion Call. And you speak of four generations of consciousness transformers. Could you tell us about these? Well, yes. Um, I, I will give you um, – I'm happy to share – um, a little bit about each of them, but I think for anyone that wants to know about these in depth, it's such a deep subject, um, it's a good idea to actually read the book because it's all there. But the four generations of consciousness transformers, as I had written about them in the book, were uh, light workers, um, followed by the indigos, followed by the crystals, and they will be followed by the rainbows. And so, you know, it begins in a way with the light workers, which, you know, there's always scouts for every um, consciousness transforming generation, as it were. There'll always be the scouts that go ahead. Um, sometimes, you know, 50 years, 100 years, even more, more so ahead, you know, of the, the waves that come in. So um, we had consciousness transformers coming in prior to 1939, the late 1930s. But my sense of it is that the... Light workers really started to incarnate in waves from 1939. It was actually during, I guess, the, the Second World War time. Uh, but the mass waves started to come in in the late 50s, the early 60s. And the light workers really are the light bearers, you know. And as I, I speak about, I'm not sure if I speak about it in Clarion Call, but I've certainly spoken about it since. Uh, this was the whole phenomena around 2112, is that when the light workers, when we had reached the um, the place of 2112, uh, that threshold, 
our journey is about transforming from light workers to light beings because the light workers in a way are the ones that have come in, they're the torch bearers, they're the ones that have blazed the trail for the ones that follow, i.e. the indigos, the crystals, the rainbows. And what will follow the rainbows is the diamond uh, generations, which I, of course, haven't written about those in Clarion Call, but I have written about them in another book, New Earth, uh, New Human, New Earth, Living in the Fifth Dimension. So the diamond race, you know, and the scouts for the diamonds were already here as well. So the scouts, all the scouts, all the generations, there's five actually, um, because the, the diamonds follow on for the rainbows. All the scouts have been here, are here. Many of those scouts, of course, have left because the scouts that were coming in as light workers were coming in sort of, you know, pre-1939. So, yeah, so we, we have the light workers who are really the, the trailblazers, the torch bearers, and the light workers, in a way, are the ones that <laughs> I don't quite know how to word this. Um, just for the sake of speed, are the ones that have had it toughest is probably the, the best way of saying it. The light workers are the ones that have literally had to come in, roll their sleeves up and really get down and get, you know, get down and get dirty in a sense of, you know, it's not been a, a pretty picture that they've had to come in and start to rearrange. So the light workers are the ones that, you know, are, I would say, very awakened light workers. I mean, of course, light workers, again, it's a, you know, multi-level generation from barely awakened to, you know, massively awakened. Um, and the, the light workers who are massively awakened are, you know, the extremely advanced, extremely evolved souls. And often what happens is people seem to think that the, the generations that follow, like the indigos, the crystals, the rainbows, the diamonds, are even more evolved than light workers. But it's not that simple. You know, it's not, it doesn't run in that way. Because on all, all these generations, there'll be the lower levels of awakening and the highest levels of awakening. Um, I would say the diamond race that comes in, they are kind of the awakened race. I don't think there's been a completely awakened race that's been here until the diamonds come in. And as I feel it, as it's given to me, they start to incarnate in waves from 2050. But the scouts are already here. So um, for anyone that really wants to know in depth about light workers, indigos, crystals and rainbows, that information is in Clarion Call. And anyone that's really interested in the diamond generations, then that information is in New Human, New Earth, Living in the Fifth Dimension, that book covered. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Nicole. This is Bridget. This is Bridget. Hello, Bridget. I have a follow-up Hello. question and I was wondering in your research of the generations, have you noticed a any trend of or of individuals of generations transforming or picking up the traits of the following generations for example like a light worker starting out as a light worker and then picking yeah. up indigo traits and then picking up um, crystal traits i understand your question well you know the interesting thing is all the generations all carry the same how can we say the same um let's call it spiritual dna uh it just means that the different generations there are specific let's call spiritual dna spiritual template divine blueprint that is active so if we look to the sort of a blueprint per se let's call it a, a sort of a, a light being a sort of um you know a spiritually awakened beings template there would be different um, sections on that template. And in an awakened being, like the diamond beings, the fully awakened beings, the whole template is, is active. My feeling is with the generations, the four generations that we're talking about from Clarion Call, um, there's either been a sole choice or there's a level of evolution that only enables uh, a specific section of the template to be uh, active now if it's an unconscious uh, evolutionary uh, reason if you like as to why only a specific aspect is active that's because that being is still very much entrenched if you like in their own personal evolution but if it is a, a very awakened light worker indigo crystal or rainbow then they have chosen as a, if you like an uh, area of speciality for what is needed here on this earth at this time and for humanity. They have chosen a specific genre, if you like, or a specific uh, arena to, um, to operate through. 
Um, so they have the whole template. We all have the, the, the whole template. So in answer to your question, the more awakened we are and the more we awaken, the more we start to resonate with those uh, active uh, elements of the templates that the other generations are um, active and expressing through. So the, the resonance goes across the board. But we each have our assignments, if you like, in quotes, our spiritual assignments, if that makes sense. Yeah, it yeah. actually yeah. makes yeah. perfect sense. So this is Sabelle again. So what do you see has been kind of our collective process from 1999 to 2012? The changes in how we operate in the world and globally, kind of the symptoms of, of that kind of thing and what was that period about for us? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can only ever answer from my own perception, you know, and as Gandhi said, a truth is a truth, but, you know, not necessarily the truth. I mean, who knows what the truth is? Do any of us know what the truth is? So I will only speak from my truth, and that may resonate with some, and it may not resonate with some, but from my truth, my perception, my you know, the information that comes to me through the ones that guide me um, and through my higher self as well, uh, as I understand it in 1999, and I physically felt this, I was consciously very aware of this, even though I actually wasn't conscious of any of this stuff at that time. I knew when 1999 came, there was something instrumental about that year. I didn't quite understand it at that time, but I knew it was instrumental. And um, and I knew that the uh, the total solar eclipse on August the 11th, 1999, at 11.11 a.m. GMT was instrumental. I was actually in Stonehenge for that, that eclipse, which was powerful. But what I, I understood and I came to realize afterwards was that we had entered what the, the Maya uh, had uh, referred to as uh, the quickening in quotes, the quickening. And this was uh, an accelerated period of uh, evolution, of conscious evolution, psychological evolution, spiritual evolution, physical evolution for the human being. And in a way, as I feel it, and as I felt it then, as I understand it, perceive it, is that 13-year window was the most accelerated 13 years in modern human history, you know, we can't go back to the times of Lemuria and Atlanta, because, uh, Atlantis because, you know, that's a whole other story. But if we look at sort of, let's say, in quotes, modern human history, um, it was an instrumental, um, unprecedented 13-year window. And I knew that we had, as, a, as individuals and as a collective, 13 years to evolve to the degree that was needed for us to cross that 2112 threshold and instead of sort of devolve from that point, continue to evolve uh, at an accelerated level. So it was an instrumentally important 13-year window. And anyone that's on a spiritual path, I've yet to have come across a single person that I know I've spoken to on a spiritual path that when you say to them, do you feel any difference between who you were uh, pre-1999 and who you are now post-2112. Every single one of them without fail will say that time, they might not say those 13 years because they may not be aware of the quickening, but they will say that that period of time was transformational beyond any other time period in their lives. So, you know, individually and collectively, we were on a, how can I say, we were on a countdown. We were on a on an evolutionary countdown, you know, to, to step up and get this done and get it done in enough time so that we could cross that threshold and make possible the, um, the golden age, if you like, the thousand years of peace, in quotes, that the indigenous uh, wise elders from millennia ago uh, had predicted, you know, right going back to the Essenes even, the Egyptians, the Essenes, the Maya, the Aborigines. I mean, it just goes across so many different cultures, um, indigenous cultures, world cultures that were not in touch with each other. You know, obviously there was none of the communication uh, stuff that we have now, but I, in, in isolated areas of the world, when you look into the um, 
you know, the, uh, the, the historical uh, teachings that have been handed out down through the generations, all of them pointed to this period of time that we're in now as, a, you know, again, an unprecedented uh, evolutionary leap for humanity. Um, and that's what 2112, were, the, the date 2112 was so, so important for was we were crossing that instrumental threshold, which is also highlighted by the astronomical and astrological activity that had been going on, uh, specifically the uh, the galactic alignment that completes in 2016. So we are still in this um, evolutionary process. Um, 2112 was the instrumental moment. It was the marker. Um, but we're still in that process till 2016. And so really, we don't, we don't start to settle from this. We had that 13-year window to 2112. We've come out the other side of that. But it's a little bit like, you know, if you're moving country, for example, uh, like I have just done, you know, I've just moved from France back to England for a while. I arrived, you know, d nearly two weeks ago, but it's going to take me at least three months to settle. Um, and that's how I feel about the, uh, the, the time between 2112 going up to 2016 of the, the completion of this galactic alignment. So we're still we're still in the in the evolutionary process at this point. That makes that sense because I know you know who I was in in 1999 and who I am now is extremely different. But one of the things for me there was a relaxation after 2012. Yeah. But right now it's like there's a, a current feeling of not knowing myself again. Okay. You know of of there's change going on and and I'm not as clear as I was from 1999 to 2012. I think was a period of growing clarity and lots mm -hmm. of change. And now I'm in, in less clarity again of who I am. Like, I guess I'm in the beginning of another change. You know, and maybe that's some of what's going on in the world. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, what happened is immediately after, after 2112, and this is the, the foundation of my work. My work is completely sourced from two things and two things alone. And one of those is the, um, the connection I have with uh, the luminous ones, the ones I call the luminous ones, with the, the council uh, that uh, work with me and work through me, uh, as well as a, a couple of other um, spiritual uh, beings on the, uh, the other side, as it were. Um, and the other aspect that is entirely influential in my work is I live the experience. I live the experience and I write about it. That's why I can write about what I do because I can do it from an authentic place. It's not a, you know, when I was seeking psychotherapy and I, I made a couple of calls, I said, I'm looking for a psychotherapy that isn't going to give me textbook answers for textbook questions. You know, it's going to see me as a soul and in, this, in the, and sort of, you know, respond to me in that way. And this is how I feel about what happened after 2112, is that we were who we were until that point. And then when we crossed that threshold, there's a whole other reality beginning to open up. So um, we went into the, the blank slate. And what happens for me is that everything I experience is I feel like I experience it for myself, but I'm also experiencing what is going on in the collective um, because the experiences I have are so extreme. And so there's a sort of this snapshot, if you like, of what I experience. I have that in a snapshot moment. So what happened for me after 2112 it was a very interesting process because for four years I had worked 18 hours a day on pushing this message, this urgent, this clarion call out to the individual and humanity that we have to arrive at this place in our own evolution if we are going to move forward and, you know, manifest what, what we can be, you know, who we can be, what we can be, what humanity can be, heaven on earth, the golden age, the thousand years of peace. Um, so my, my whole focus had been on this and this alone for four years. And then suddenly we reached 2112 and it was done. And there was that moment on the 22nd of December for me was, well, where to from here? You know, and I had no directive. I had absolutely no idea. I had a sense that everything was going to change. My, if you like, my directive for my work would, would do a 180 degree turnaround and it would be going down a very, very different path. And I'd been, as I do uh, every day, uh, post on Facebook. I use my uh, Facebook wall as a teaching platform. 
And I just didn't know what to, to post. And I had to just post what I was with. And what I was with is what I called the blank slate. The, the slate had been wiped clean. And that slate was for us to, uh, again, as individuals and collective, to start to write a new story. Not his story, history, not her story, but this story, our story at an individual and a collective level. So I just stayed true to that. So uh, I just posted whatever I was with and what I was with at that time was the blank slate. So I talked a lot about that. If anyone's interested in uh, seeing what I was posting immediately after 2112, then just go to my Facebook page and scroll back to, you know, late December 2012, January, February, March, because it was up until the spring equinox that I was out on a limb. You know, I really had no idea where I was going from there with the work, but I knew I was being guided and the work was going to take on a whole different, uh, you know, tra 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 trajectory. And so we got to sort of spring equinox and I started to feel the energy coming back in again. I started to get a sense of where we need to go, where this needs to go now. And I'm still in the early phases of that. It's still only June. And as I said, until 2016, when this grand alignment completes, we, we're kind of in that phase. So what you're, you're describing there about how you're feeling, uh, I almost get a sense is getting to know your new self, if you like, your post-2112 self this kind of the being that you have stepped over that threshold as um, that's going to take time because we are incarnating all the time we are incarnating these higher aspects of ourselves and the in quotes agenda uh, is entirely different everything is different everything changed on that date and as I wrote about again for anyone who's interested it's all on my timeline on Facebook the timelines the timelines converged so, you know, and I felt that so, so strongly. I was writing about that leading up to 2112 as well, that all the timelines were converging. So past lives, future lives, everything was converging into this moment now. And this is what's so important about how we're living now, is to be in the moment, living in the now. And this is all we can know, this moment right now. And it can change. And we just change with it. So even with this interview, we had this moment where we said, oh, you know, maybe we should... Uh, look at the next book and we have that choice to do that we can sort of say okay let's close this now let's not do this today let's actually do the new book we have that choice living in the moment and it's so freeing and it's so liberating and so I feel this trust with a capital T uh, in response again to what you were sharing um, it's trusting um, living in the moment and just knowing you know with gnosis just that and I'm sure you feel that at the deepest level in yourself all is well. And I know I say that on my four minutes and four seconds of peace video, but it's a truth. All is well. We are exactly where we need to be as long as we are awakened and we are continuing to consciously evolve and remain engaged, actively engaged, joyfully engaged in every single experience we have in every moment of our lives, then we are absolutely where we're meant to be. Nicole, yeah. Nicole yeah. have you have noticed you that um, after the spring equinox, the healing that is still being done with people has transformed from individual healing to a combination of both individual and group healing or collective healing? Right. Can you just say a little bit more about that? What, what do you well, think? so if I have I if I have an issue that I'm working, if I have a shadow issue that I'm working on that that will bubble up as something that someone I'm close to is also working on or it just feels like it's um, something that lots of people are working on and it needs to be cleared for everyone. Yes, the individual clearing for the collective, absolutely, yes. It's much more conscious. You see, here's the other thing. Post-21, uh, pre-2112, it was very much about what was in the unconscious, and as we've crossed that threshold, if we were to look at, uh, let's say, an astrology chart, <clears throat> you would have the, if you were to sort of cut that chart in half, you would have the bottom half, which would represent the unconscious, and you would have the top half of the chart that represents the conscious, the conscious mind. So what you're speaking about is as we've moved, we've crossed that 2112 threshold, the, the unconscious has become conscious. So we were 
at many levels we were the individual was healing for the collective before but there was an unconscious uh, relationship to that that's now become very conscious and when it becomes conscious and people become consciously aware as I heal for myself I'm healing for others I'm healing for humanity at some level when that becomes conscious that intent that conscious intent is going out into the world and it is you know it's like a, a light arrow you know, I, again, in my new book, I write about the 21 arrows, the First Nations people oral teaching, which is actually the first I've written, the first uh, ever account, full account of the 21 arrows, seven dark, seven light, seven rainbow arrows. And so this intent this sort of as I heal for, for, for myself, I heal for others is like a light arrow that's being fired out that intent. And so it's kind of it, it opens a space. It opens a collective space. Um, it opens that collective space wider for these light arrows of consciousness in terms of our own healing to to go into that sort of collective space and permeate those who are still very unconscious because of course there wasn't an instant awakening of humanity conscious awakening of humanity that happened on 2112 and as i said in 21 uh, in my book clarion call and as I've said in interviews and people have said to me pre-2112, well, you know, what's going to happen on 2112? Are we going to wake up and is the world going to be transformed? And as I've said also, you know, I had friends saying, oh, I won't need my glasses and I won't need my bank account. And we'll, we all would have ascended. And, and it's like, no, you know, everything's going to look the same. You know, we'll wake up on 2212, 2012, and everything will look the same. But at a fundamental level, at foundational level, nothing is the same. Everything has changed. And yet there are still, you know, mass portions of humanity who are walking around unconscious, they're still asleep. But those of us, you know, the growing numbers of those of us who are consciously awake and consciously awakening and having these realizations and these felt experiences that you've just shared there, uh, the more of us that are doing that, the more that will begin to permeate into the unconscious of the consciously asleep mass, which is where, again, uh, our attention as a sort of a collective uh, group of awakened beings across the planet, this is where our attention is also turned in, you know, permeating mass consciousness that is asleep. It's very, very important. Thank you for that. I can't wait to read your new book. When is it going to be out? 15th of August. It's, it's, it's available for pre-order now on Amazon. Okay, and, great. And through Inner Traditions and Barnes and & Noble and various other outlets. Uh, Nicole, as you were talking, I just have had an incredible um, tingling, uh, goosebumps all over, on goosebumps, on goosebumps. And and what you've said is, is what I've observed both in myself and, and in the greater... Uh, in my observables, right? I, because, but thank you. I there's there's quite a resonance coming with mm-hmm. this conversation. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Chipper. This is Sabelle again, and yeah, what you said does make some things more clear for me. So I I really appreciate that. And in in my my other world, I spend a lot of time talking to older people. Many of the people in their seventies think that the 60s failed in some way and they're very sad about the world that's left for the young people you know and then I I start to hear how the young people are doing things differently like the you know the protesters in Brazil organizing on Facebook and saying we don't want a leader that's not how we operate how do you see how would you tell someone who's in their 70s who thinks the 60s failed what's happening Mm -hmm. yeah uh, are we, Sybil, are we talking about um, uh, spiritually awakened people in their 70s or are we talking about, you know, people who are still consciously, uh, spiritually and psychologically asleep? Because there's going to be a different answer for, <laughs> who, who, you know, depending which one we're talking about. Yeah, I guess these are people who, you know, they they were part of the protest, they were part of trying to wake things up, being the flower children, and they're just not seeing the results that they had wanted. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, well, what I would say to them is, you know, again, you know, it's just my my humble uh, take on it. The, what I would say is that, again, you know, everything has changed. But you see, it depends which sort of what eyes we're looking at this through. You know, if you have uh, eyes that can see, like, for example, the way I can see for myself, I can see that everything has changed. People that maybe don't have that sight, if you like, in quotes, the sight um, that maybe they can't see what's changed. But, you know, the 60s were instrumental. I mean, they were as instrumental as that 13 year period of, of the quickening. Everything, everything changed. The 60s were instrumental. So the 60s, in a way, uh, was kind of like the foundation stone for or has been the foundation stones for this mass movement towards change, towards um, empowerment, people empowerment, towards uh, trying to change what has been set in stone for millennia in terms of if we look at sort of uh, the environment and you know, politics and uh, government rule and authority systems and so forth, the 60s were the, the catalyst. And this again is when the mass waves of the light workers came in. Uh, the scouts were coming in before then, but the mass waves came in um, around the 60s. But we also had great waves coming in around, 30, uh, around 1939. So that those first waves that started to come in were, you know, the, the teenagers and the 20-somethings in the 50s and the 60s. And they, they blazed the trail. I say I bow to anyone who was teenage years upwards in the six, late 50s and the 60s because I bow in honor to those people because they were the trailblazers. And all those of us that have followed since then have literally followed their trails. So th these people that you, you're speaking about, I find it sad in a way that they, they're unable to see the instrumental role that they have played for all these generations that follow. But change is never an overnight thing when we're looking at it on a global scale. But anything that is going on out there in terms of protests, you know, even movements like Avars, you know, all of these sort of um, societal transformational uh, movements and actions are born out of the 60s. They're born from the people. The people that were initiated all these projects are the, you know, the founders, if you like, of this type of movement. So in a way, it's sad that they're not able to see that those changes are happening. And it does look like, you know, from surface level, it looks like everything's actually getting a lot worse than it's ever been. But it's not. You know, it's, if you like, it's like um, when, a, you know, if we, we have a, a wound on the arm, let's say we had a wound on the arm, the, it's the, all the, the pus, if you like, starts to come to the surface and it starts to seep out. It's beginning to clean itself. And how I see what is happening on a global scale um, is the, the, the wound of humanity. Uh, and this goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years because we human beings have been ruled. They've been dominated. They've been controlled. They've been manipulated. They've been abused. They've been, you know, every shadow thing that can happen to a human being has happened to humanity for thousands of years. And so this wound of humanity that was probably um, deep under the skin uh, wasn't really visible until the, the the last century when it started to become more visible, especially the 60s. I feel like the 60s in a way sliced that wound open. And since then, we could say um, the, the past, if you like, of the wound has been rising to the surface and now it's spilling out everywhere. So if we look at it just from that perspective, we can say, my God, that looks a mess. But it's actually what needs to happen, because once all those layers of poison, if you like, have risen to the surface and cleared, then we have a clean wound. And then we can start to work in a different way with that. That's what I see is happening with humanity. And I feel that this really does go on till about 2050. I feel 2020, um, and I don't mean that in terms of the calendar year, but I think these calendar years are important in the sense that they give humanities uh, a focus for specific dates, if you like. And I feel 2020 is an important turning point year, 2016. Certainly when we come to the end of the Grand Alignment, then we go from 2016 to 2020. 2020 feels an instrumental 
turning point. Um, but 2050 for me, when you know none of us will be here then, or maybe some of us would have come back as diamonds. Um, we 2050 is when we start to feel, or we start to see, and we start to feel that that wound is completely clear. But it doesn't mean to say we have to wait until then before we can start to see something positive happening at individual and collective level on a global scale. Because as the wound starts to clear at the deeper levels of it, even though we can't see them, it's cleared. What we're seeing now is the surface level that's coming out. And if we look at thousands of years clearing in, you know, not, not even a century, probably a century because if we look at the 1950s being instrumental, 1960s being instrumental, then by the time we get to 2050, we're looking at a century, a century to clear, you know, a wound that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So I would say to someone that, that asks me that question, I would explain that in the way that I just have and say, please, you know, have faith. I bow to you because it's because of you and your generation, that I stand here now, we stand here now with the potential that we have. And, you know, it is about unity consciousness. This is why social media, Facebook in particular, is so, so important, because we can all connect globally and unite and accelerate this process as needed, because time has speeded up, as we know. Thank you. Thank you. That's very reassuring. And, um, you know, I think... Part of it is for the people I'm talking to, and the change that you're feeling is intuited instead of televised. Yes. And they're looking at what's on television, and they're thinking that you know the world isn't changing for the better. And the activism that's going on in the younger generation, you know, an internal change in people is is not is it's not the kind of things that that they did in the '60s. It's not as visible in that way. So I'm, I'm glad what you said. Thank you. Nicolia, this is Susan. And listening to you is actually very healing for me. And I'd like to tell you why. And that is because for so long I've wandered around looking for people who spoke of healing on a collective level. Because I know in myself part of my journey has been about doing my work but as you say, going, looking in every nook and cranny and tracing it back. And I would find that it was generation after generation after generation after generation till you go back to the very beginning. And not too many people have spoken about this. So to hear you speak of it is wonderful. I can't thank you enough. It also reinforces to me what it's been an intuitive belief on my part in that everything I do and everything I'm healing, I don't do it for just me. Mm -hmm. I do it for all of us. Yeah. And I would love for that awareness maybe to blossom a bit and have that reverence for each other and bow to each other, as you say, because I think in, we're all doing it. The other thing I'd like to say is that this is exactly why I find your work so helpful. You place a, a, a big emphasis on the psychological integration. As I said before, some people feel that they can just be beamed up to ascension or whatnot. But it is hard work. I think, As you say, it will get easier the more we all do our little bit. But I also would be curious to hear your perspective on all the fears that are surfacing right now, survival mechanisms, the push for base pleasures and materialism. Is this sort of a last ditch effort at healing before we move into a new phase? Okay, so I just want to understand your question a little mm -hmm. bit more clearly so I can respond to it. It seems a bit like the, the more we move towards healing, there's also this pull backwards. And I'm wondering if there's such a pressure now for fears to arise, um, survival, attending to our pleasures, and, you know, 
a draw towards materialism. I'm not talking about if everyone is an awakened person, but mm-hmm. there seems to be in the collective this yeah. pull to go backwards. Yeah. Is that sort of something that needs to be cleaned out before the collective can go forward? Well, I'll, I'll try and answer your your um, question as um, clearly as I can. I, I can only answer everything that I, I say it just comes from my feelings. So I, mm. I can't hear a question with my head, but I want to just... I want to answer that, and I also want to address something you were saying about we heal for each other. And it's just an important point I wanted to add here is that I say that, you know, more and more light workers are incarnating into, in quotes, normal families. You know, I have this kind of like little jokey statement that I say amongst my friends, you know, uh, every family should have one. (laughs) (laughs) Have a lot of them. Because basically, um, we note, you know, that probably amongst our friends, our contemporaries and so forth, that, you know, we are of a certain consciousness and our families are often very, very different. You know, we were very different in our families when we were growing up and, you know, what we has meaning for us and what we are dedicated to in our lives is often incredibly different to the yeah. lives that our mums and our dads and our brothers and our sisters and our cousins and aunts and uncles, uncles and so forth are living. Now, the way I, the reason I feel this is happening is that, that light workers, you know, this is a, it's a multi-dimensional question in the sense that where do we all come from? You know, uh, what, yes. what do we come from different dimensions? Yes, we do. So we have, let's say, for example, souls that have been incarnating again, the, the mass waves in the late 1930s, uh, incarnating into from from higher dimensions, evolved souls coming in and incarnating into family environments of a a, a lower consciousness it's, it's mm. not a job it's just you know it's just how it can be and what's happening is when you have a light being in the family the more awakened that light being is the the more of a blessing that light being's presence is in the family and what it actually does just by that light being being in the family even if they're never ever understood by any mm. of their family members ever when their family members pass over and they are able to look at their son, daughter, mother, father, sister, brother, still on the earth plane, the the light being, they will see with clarity what this being has done by incarnating into their family. Because what happens is it clears the lineage. So the light beings are coming in. This is part of what's happening on a collective level. The collective thing that is going on by the individual. So I'm saying this. It's a very important point because I want to say to anyone that's listening to this program that if you are spiritually, psycho-spiritually, I say, psychological and spiritual, psycho-spiritually awakened being, and you feel... You know, the black sheep of the family, you feel misunderstood, you feel judged, you feel all these different things that people can feel. Take heart with the fact that you have incarnated into that family because you are you are in service. You are in yeah. service of that lineage. So it's very important to, 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 to say that because if you imagine all the families on the planet, and yes. not all of the families on the planet have a light, light worker. So I think that the consciousness of each family, even if it's, it appears to be unconscious, it's probably less unconscious than the other families at this point that have not got a light being in them, but they will attract those in time. But what's happening is millions of light beings across the world are planted in families, millions of families across the world, clearing the lineage, clearing the ancestral uh, lineage, the ancestral wound, and for the generations to come. So I just wanted to say that. that come back to your question (laughs) (laughs) i so appreciate what you say it's it's just music to my ears and makes my heart so warm thank you but carry on thank you thank you um yes in response to the fear scenario um people sort of um polarizing if you like um yes my feeling is, you know, we're sensory beings, human beings are sensory beings, and no matter how desensitized, um, you know, uh, the life has become because of the way the consumer culture, you know, the, the whole setup, the way it is, no matter how desensitized uh, human beings have become, they are still fundamentally sensitive beings, sensory beings. And so even those that are unconscious, if you like, 
are sensing something. They couldn't put words to it. They, they wouldn't even begin to understand what it is, but it's like the receptors. Every being has what I call uh, in, in our energy fields, we, we have receptors. I see them as like the, if you could see my hands, my hands are open at the moment and they're sort of just um, planting themselves in different places around my energy field. And these are like, you know, hundreds, millions, I don't know how many there are receptors in our energy fields. Now for, for beings that, who are awakened, the receptors are wide open. So the more awakened we are, the more sensitive we are, the more intuitive we are, the more psychic we are, and so forth. Um, because the receptors, the more receptors are open in the unconscious people, if you like, those receptors are closed. They're there, but they're closed. Now, some of those receptors are going to be open. So what happens is in the collective field, the collective consciousness, because we have this sort of uh, rising of consciousness, and as, as opposed to raising, we have a rising of consciousness because we, again, you know, social media and our capacity to uh, communicate with each other ap across the globe at a click of a button has really allowed, you know, positive side of social media is the incredible facilitator it is for um, manifesting unity consciousness. So as that is growing at an exponential rate, what is happening for those whose receptors are closed or have not, you know, there's always going to be one or two receptors open, even if it's just one receptor, it's picking it up. It's like a radar. It's picking it up. Now, we know that people fear the unknown. People are safe in the known. So what is happening is the as awakened beings are awakening more and more receptors are opening, more of the higher self is incarnating, more of this healing is happening for the individual to the collective and so forth. As that is growing, what is happening is there's a polarizing happening because the, let's say, unconscious people who the mass, let's just call them the mass for now, the mass who are, are still caught in the matrix, are still caught in the unconscious uh, state, their one sense, you know, their one sensor, their one receptor, their one radar is still picking something up and reacting because whole scale change is what is needed. And so there's the beginnings. This, to me, this reaction uh, and, and, you know, in terms of what you were saying about the fear and people sort of becoming more material and so forth, unconscious, um, it's a reaction, an unconscious reaction against stepping into the unknown because as one receptor awakens and then another one awakens another one opens and so forth people then have to ask themselves questions so there's a huge amount of fear also because of what's happening politically on a global scale it's very destabilizing we are in unstable destabilizing times so people are clinging on to the known even more so because they're not at a level of consciousness where they can, one, surrender, or two, embrace change and be willing to make changes. People are scared. So this is why it's very important that the consciousness that we are holding, the awareness that, that's been spoken about on this uh, interview today around the, the individual's healing for the collective, the firing of the light arrow, if you like, into that collective field, in terms of the holding the intention as I heal for myself, I heal for my brothers and my sisters on this planet, including all the kingdoms of the earth, you know, the animals, the plants, these are all our brothers and sisters too. So as we hold that intent with our own healing, so we take it up an octave rather than, oh, I'm just healing for myself, we're holding the intent, yes, I'm healing for myself and I'm aware that this is going to permeate, this is going to resonate out from my field and and impact. And the, the other piece I want to say on this is, um, I can't remember the exact date now, but recently, uh, I think it was possibly uh, March of last year, but I haven't got my dates in front of me, but an instrumental moment in astrology happened when Neptune moved back into Pisces. Uh, Pisces is a sign that it rules, of course. And Neptune, um, I love Neptune, I know a lot about Neptune, is um, it's it, it represents many things, creativity, spirituality, but more than anything for the times we're living in, it represents beyond personal. And yes, so yes. At consciousness level uh, for awakened, psycho-spiritually awakened beings, we are moving into a unified consciousness field of beyond personal. 
And that is happening on every level of our being, be that our relationships, how we are communicating, interacting with loved ones, partners, uh, work colleagues, associates. Um, it's beyond personal. We're beginning to come into a place of neutrality and know that what we are doing and what we're saying is is beyond personal. So what is happening, the point I'm trying to make with this, as we move into this beyond personal uh, collective consciousness field that Neptune brings in with it, and last time Neptune was in Pisces was 144 years ago, 146 years ago, it was a long time ago, we have you know, instrumental astrological and astronomical configurations that are continuing uh, to, to go on. And in fact, in Clarion Call, I listed it was so profound when I looked into what is actually going on astronomically and astrologically. And from an Earth energy perspective, it had to be listed. And it really is like jaw dropping when you actually read what was happening leading up to 2112 from an Earth energy and astronomical and astrological perspective. But that continues. So we have Neptune who's taking us into a beyond personal uh, realm now. And so again, for the mass in quotes, um this is a whole you know this is a whole unknown it's an unknown quantum if you like for many people who are awake but they are embracing it you know this is wonderful sort of thing but for people who are the, the mass who are unconscious their radar is picking that up too and that's frightening so as we as awakened beings are uh, evolving in this beyond personal consciousness um this again is slowly but surely going to permeate through to the masses. Yes, I, I can resonate with very deeply with what you're saying. And I also have another question, and it has again to do with a transpersonal planet, and that's Chiron, the wounded healer, mm -hmm. which was discovered in 1977. Yeah. For my own self, I feel that that was a evolutionary prompt that was very powerful and I know it has been for myself and some others. I wonder if you could speak on that for just a moment. Well, yes. I mean, I'm probably not going to be able to say much more than you. Yes, 1977, Chiron asteroid was discovered. Uh, and as these asteroids and planets and so forth are discovered, they are instrumental moments for the evolution of humanity, as was Chiron. And as we know, it was from 1977 that suddenly therapy, alternative remedies, alternative this, therapy this, uh, Reiki that, you know, um, Chinese medicine this, acupuncture that, all started to break the surface. And people started to begin to empower themselves. They began to start to ask questions. Chiron, of course, was the, um, the guide in that. And as we know, Chiron is the wounded healer. Um, and in astrology, and again, anyone listening to this might be interested to find out where their Chiron is in their natal birth chart, because wherever Chiron is in your natal birth chart shows where your deepest wound is that you've come here to heal in this lifetime. It may not be the deepest, deepest, deepest wound, because you may be healing that in future lifetimes, but your deepest wound for this lifetime is shown where Chiron is in your natal chart. And at the same time, wherever Chiron is positioned in your natal chart also reveals your greatest capacity to heal others. So this is why Chiron is the wounded healer, because as we heal ourselves, we then become the healers uh, for others. So uh, that's an important thing to, to, to note. Um, so yes, I can't really say a lot more on Chiron. I have actually mentioned Chiron in the book, of course, in Clarion Call. Um, so yeah, I don't quite know what else to say on that subject but yeah well i think it's enough enough to just direct people to the possibilities of what they might discover if they search out their own chiron but i know like for myself it's been extremely powerful and it's been certainly probably the most powerful uh focus for personal and collective healing and as you say, it's brought in this whole new wave of seeking healing in a different way, in, uh, not just on the physical material plane, but in in from the gross to the subtle, Absolutely. if you will. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. This completes part one of two of our symposium, 
with Nicolia Christie.